Capri. Thank you so much, Commissioner Works Chapter. I think um, you had the challenge of reading all of our legalese, and I really appreciate your leadership um, on the commissioner on the commission and in the community. LA Civil Rights is excited to bring you this training on stopping hate. This is our fourth training in this series. And it's one of the many events we have uh, hosted for the transgender, African-American, immigrant, um, Latino, and other communities. At LA Civil Rights, we believe in being intentional about uh, dealing with discrimination, inequity, and hate head on with resources to provide um, um, assistance for our residents. That is why we have launched the LA for All campaign. You may see uh, the images behind us here in the colorful background scene on our screens. Um, we have launched this anti-hate PSA public service announcement campaign that has been translated into 17 languages to date. And we have engaged in over 4,000 ad spaces across the city of Los Angeles. It is why we are building an office of racial equity, discrimination enforcement, and much more that we'll be launching soon from our newly acquired headquarters down in the LA Mall, just under uh, City Hall. Um, we are hosting this event today to give you the tools that you need to keep yourself and your community safe. Uh, to learn more about us, you can go to our website, civilandhumanrights.lacity.org. Again, you can learn more about us at civilandhumanrights, all one word, dot lacity.org. Now, I am honored at this time to introduce a strong supporter of our department and a real champion for equity and diversity in Los Angeles, our friend, supporter, and fearless leader, Councilman Paul Koretz. Thank you. Councilman Koretz, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Capri, for that kind introduction. And it means so much to me to welcome every one of you to today's training. As we all know, these are particularly troubling times. We can watch the news and see the global chaos and become overwhelmed. But what's even more disconcerting is that we need not look outside of our own region. We can just drive down our own LA streets and be washed over by the tension, poverty and depression that has blanketed our own communities. Between the COVID-19 pandemic, the economy, homelessness, climate change, the polarized political landscape and increasing hate, tensions are high and the public is scared. As a Jewish American who lost many family members to hate and particularly as a council member of the fifth district which includes the historically Jewish communities of Beverly Fairfax and Pico Robertson. Right. This past year has been incredibly stressful and heartbreaking as the increase in hate and particularly in anti-Semitism is on the rise. We're witnessing increasing acts of violence, hate and scare tactics against Jews. And the best way to feel emboldened against this increasing fear is preparation, training and knowledge. So I'd like to thank the Civil and Human Rights and Equity Department for hosting today's training. Uh, there are a few takeaways I wanna flag for you. One of the greatest challenges we face today is the sad reality of increased hate crimes and hate incidents. Many feel emboldened to commit these heinous acts. However, we need to fight back. There are tools in our tool chest, but we have to be educated on how to use them and how to be effective. One of the problems our communities come across is a lack of reporting. I don't believe we have accurate data or statistics on the level of hate crimes that occur daily in our city. Many of these incidents go unreported, which means there are no subsequent investigations. We must work together to fight hate and the best way to do that is to educate and know what to do if we or someone we know is a victim of a hate crime. 
In my office, we get reports of hate crimes regularly. Constituents will call several days or even several weeks after the fact and provide a narrative of what happened. However, that doesn't help much. Hate incidents to be meaningfully reported really need to be reported in real time as they occur or right after they, are, they occur by contacting the LAPD or calling 311 or 211. This way the LAPD or other relevant agency can respond quickly and work to appreh apprehend the suspects if they're still in the area. In addition, 211 and 311 can take hate incident reports and connect victims to social services if applicable. Folks should know that the LAPD will never ask for immigration status. There should never be any reason for hesitation on the part of the victim to report a hate crime. The city of LA is committed to making sure that all victims have their voices heard and their reports safely filed. I'm committed to you in this fight as we work together to make sure that our children and our children's children don't have to face hate in Los Angeles. I'm your partner, your ally. And my office's unwavering commitment is focused on this as one of my critical priorities. I thank all the departments involved and agencies that are here today and uh, look forward to hearing everything that you have to offer. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Claret, for your support. Now I'd like to introduce LAPD Deputy Chief Blake Chow to explain the differences between a hate crime and a hate incident, as well as some of the steps that LEPD is taking to respond to hate. Deputy Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, commissioner, commissioners, council member. Uh, my name is Blake Chow. I'm deputy chief with the LAPD. And I kind of wanted to let everybody know, use this opportunity to learn and come up, you know, when you log off tonight, have more tools in your bag to make sure that we, number one, take a stand against hate as a society, because only until then will be will this problem start to diminish, but also uh, tools to really keep yourself safe. So, and you know, as we uh, come into the uh, Jewish High Holy Days in, in uh, early, you know, in September, I wanted to kind of just kind of um, talk about some anti-Semitic, uh, hate incident and hate crime statistics um, and but before I do that I wanted to, to kind of explain to people the difference between a hate crime and hate incident both both of these things LAPD will come out and take a report and it's and I'll tell you why it's important to take a report so a hate incident is basically a um, act where an individual may call somebody a uh, name it could be um, based on your nationality uh, sexual orientation it could be based on religion but there's no crime involved it's just a you know an utterance of um you know a, it's an act of hate that doesn't have a doesn't have a crime attached to it a lot of people think well i'm not going to report those because i don't want to bother anybody but we do need them reported and the reason we need them reported is because again as a society we need to make sure that we take a stand against these types of acts and it's important because when the LAPD comes out and documents a hate incident, um, we get a very good picture about what's happening with, within our community. As a council member mentioned, I believe we are underreported, unfortunately, but we, so we still need to report as much as we can. And there's even been some instances where individuals have been documented being involved in hate incidents that turn into hate crimes later on. And then that becomes important in the prosecution, which I believe Adrian will probably go into a little bit later. A hate crime is a crime with an element of hate in it. It doesn't have to be motivated completely by a, a motivation of hate. So it could be somebody that punches somebody in the face. It would be a battery. It could be an aggravated assault where there's a weapon involved. It could be a criminal threat where somebody threatens to uh, you know, do violence or harm against somebody, or it could be um, a vandalism but you have to have the element of the crime. And then in the commission of that crime, you will have a element where an individual may be, the suspect may be uttered something and call the, the victim a name or, or that type of thing. Um, that is a hate crime. And when we can prove that, uh, our detectives will do the investigation, will um, we'll get charges filed against the suspect. 
And the reason it's important to prove the hate, um, the hate portion is because when we file the cases with the DA or the, or the city attorney, um, they're eligible for an enhancement of either one, of either one, two or three years based upon the, the initial crime. But again, just like with hate incidents, we need to have them reported so that we get an understanding about what's happening in society. So um, as far as anti-Semitic um, hate crimes, um, unfortunately, as you know, council member alluded to, they're up this year. Um, in, in 2020, at this time last year, we only had 39 anti-Semitic hate crimes reported. And this year we're already up to 59. So that's about a 50% uh, increase. And then as far as hate incidents in 2020, we had 24 reported and in 2021 we're already up to 40. And this trend unfortunately is not just specific to anti-Semitic. This is almost across the board with all hate crimes. And it's been a very, very, very busy year as you know um, because of a lot of things that have been going on in society, the hate crimes are really increasing quite significantly. And again, I, if you look at the numbers, I believe in a city this size, we are underreported. Um, so, you know, what, what can you do? Number one, if you see something, say something. I know we say that a lot, but if you're out and you see an individual calling another individual name or engaging, engaging in a hate incident, you need to pick up the phone and call 911. If you're not comfortable with that because you don't want to, um, you know, you don't want to deal with the police, you can call 211 or 311 and still report it. But it's best to have the police come out there so we can get an officer out there and conduct an investigation. Um, same thing with the hate crime. Uh, we want you to call 911. Um, I, th I think Adrian may go into a little bit about what you can do to kind of defend yourself or defend other people. Um, but we want you to be a good witness. So we would like you to, if you can, record that on a cell phone so we can use that in prosecution, get a good description of the suspect, how tall this person was, what kind of clothing they were wearing, if they get into a vehicle, what kind of vehicle, get a photo of the license plate, all those. And well, then also make sure that you are uh, you, you um, are identifying what would classify it as a hate crime. So we want you to kind of listen to kind of what is being said. And that all that information will go into a crime report. And then once the suspect is arrested, it'll be packaged up and sent over to the district attorney's office. So again, like I say, um, very important for people to be aware of, of where they are. If you see something, say something that is extremely important. And please don't be af afraid to report it. Um, we prefer 911 because we can take immediate action. But if for some reason somebody's not comfortable with that, there are other options through the city to report hate crimes and hate incidents. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. So now let's get into the rights and resources for victims of hate as well as bystanders and allies. Next up, uh, we're gonna hear from Adrian Rojas. Adrian is a victim rights attorney, former LA County deputy district attorney and the president elect of the Philippine American Bar Association, also known as PABA. Welcome Adrian. Thank you, good evening. Uh, thank you, commissioner for that introduction. Before I begin my presentation, I do wanna reiterate the following disclaimer. Uh, the views expressed during presentations made at Civil Human Rights and Equity Department, the LA Civil Rights uh, meetings or other events sponsored or co-sponsored by LA Civil Rights are those of the speaker and not necessarily of LA Civil Rights. Presentations at LA Civil Rights events or the presence of vendors at LA Civil Rights events does not constitute an endorsement of the vendors or speakers views, products or services. This presentation and anything discussed during this presentation should not be construed as creating or intending to create an attorney-client relationship. If you require legal assistance, you should immediately contact an attorney. Well, with that being said, so here we are um, 18 months into the pandemic and hopefully uh, we are seeing some sense of normalcy. And unfortunately, even though we're transitioning back into normalcy, we are still seeing an increase in hate incidents and hate crimes. And I think Chief Chow uh, talked about that and he also talked about the differences between a hate incident and a hate crime. But I do want to reiterate that a hate crime is in fact a criminal offense against a person or property uh, motivated in whole or in part by the offender's bias against a race, 
religion, disability, sexual orientation, ethnicity, gender, or gender identity. In California, a hate crime requires more than just a racially motivated statement. So while the statement such as go back to where you came from uh, might be classified as a hate incident, in the criminal arena, there needs to be uh, that statement plus a threat of violence, actual violence, or destruction of property. Now, obviously hate incidents and hate crimes are not new, but especially over the past year, uh, we have seen the rise in hate incidents and hate crimes on the news and on social media, especially as it relates to the Asian Pacific Islander communities, as well as our Jewish community. And we've seen enough of these incidents and crimes on social media. Uh, and for me, there are usually two commonalities uh, when I see these incidents on, on, the, on social media or on the news. Uh, the first common factor is that these incidents happen in a public area or in an open area, um, on a sidewalk, on a bus, on a street corner. And the second common factor is that there are people either videotaping the incident or watching this hate incident turn into a hate crime and doing nothing about it. And when we see these crimes on social media and on the news, our reactions are, are usually to the effect of that's horrible, or I would have fought back or I would have intervened. Or if you're like my wife, who's also an attorney, uh, she would probably say, I would have pepper sprayed that person, or I would have definitely defended the person who was being uh, attacked. And I realized that my wife reacts that way because she's also a lawyer, and she also has a basic understanding of self-defense laws in California. But to the average lay person who's standing on the sidelines, as these hate incidents turn into brutal hate crimes and hate-based attacks, I'm pretty sure they're wondering, what can I do to protect myself? What can I do to protect that random person who's being attacked? And I'm sure you've thought to yourself, is a law on my side if I choose to respond with force? A few months ago, actually in March of this year, a few of you may have seen a video of an elderly 76 year old Asian American woman who was standing on the corner of Market Street in San Francisco. And we saw how she was attacked. And we also saw how she fought back to defend herself. And we also saw another video out of New York in, involving a Filipino American woman uh, by the name of Vilma Carey, who was attacked on March 30th on a sidewalk on West 43rd Street in New York. And this particular video was disturbing because Ms. Carey was being attacked. Uh, as she was being attacked, we saw surveillance video of the two doormen who were standing by watching the attack and, and doing nothing about the attack. And once in a while, we've seen videos where bystanders actually do intervene. Now, God forbid you're ever in that situation where you're either being attacked or you're witnessing a hate-based attack. But what are your general rights? And how would law enforcement assess whether or not you were acting in lawful self-defense or, act, or acting in defense of others? In California law, you have the basic right to defend yourself. And that basic right also exists uh, and extends to defending others. Now, under normal circumstances outside the concept, context of self-defense, if you were to use force or deadly force on someone, then you would be criminal, criminally liable for a um, charges, which would be brought against you by a prosecuting agency. And as Chief Chow mentioned earlier, it would either be the city attorney or the district attorney, and in rare circumstances, the attorney general. But if you acted in lawful self-defense, then you would not be liable for a crime. And it's a complete defense. And that legal defense protects the, that individual from criminal liability. Uh, unfortunately, obviously, as with most laws in the state, uh, the law is very technical. It has a lot of legal jargon. But the general rule is that if you use lawful force, when you reasonably and legitimately believe that you or another person is in imminent danger of physical harm. And, and you believe that that use of force is necessary to stop the danger. Now, of course, that begs the question of what is lawful, what is legitimate, and what is reasonable uh, under California law. Uh, when, when we're in court and when the prosecutor or law enforcement is determining whether or not uh, self-defense or defense of other applies, they break it up into three elements. And the first element of, of legal self-defense 
is whether you reasonably believe that you or someone else was in imminent danger of suffering bodily injury or was in imminent danger of being un unlawfully touched. The second element being you reasonably believed that the immediate use of force was necessary to defend against that danger and you use no more force than was reasonably necessary to defend against that danger. And what does this all mean? Now, as prosecutors, when they're assessing a case, uh, they will look into whether or not there was an imminent danger. And what this means is that uh, there has to be a threat or a threat of harm that is immediate and that is imminent. Now, let's take the case of the elderly woman who was standing uh, on the street corner that I talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, she was standing on the street corner and she was punched unprovoked. And, and that, that elderly lady uh, chose to respond and defend herself. She had a wooden stick. She hit the attacker with that wooden stick and she did everything possible to protect further attack on her. And in that situation, it was clear that self-defense applied because the attack was ongoing, the attack was imminent, and she reasonably believed that she needed to protect herself in order to prevent further attack. And the law will also question whether or not a reasonable person would have acted the same way that she had acted. If the answer is yes, a reasonable person would have acted the way she acted, then there is a strong argument for self-defense. And of course, the law will also look into what is reasonable force. And the force essentially must be proportional to the threat of harm that the person is facing or the threat uh, that someone else is facing when it applies to defense of others. As a general rule, if someone came up to me and said, go back to where you came from and sucker punched me in the face. Um, and, I chose to suck, I, and I chose to punch that person back in that situation, self-defense would apply because my response was proportional. But if I responded by pulling out a bat and clobbering that person, I would question whether or not that is proportional to the harm that I was facing uh, when that person sucker punched me once in the face. In that situation, it would be hard to argue that you were acting in self-defense because that the response was not proportional. And what if you witness an attack? Um, what are your rights as a bystander? And I talked a few minutes ago very briefly about uh, Vilma Carey. She was the um, elderly lady who was walking to church um, and she was attacked on the sidewalk when two uh, male individuals who were standing inside a building, building lobby uh, watched and did nothing. What rights would they have? Now in that situation, um, it would be the same analysis for self-defense because it's the same elements for self-defense as is defense of others. Now, the two individuals stood at the lobby a few feet away from the attack and watched it and did nothing. But what would their rights be if they chose to, uh, to respond and to intervene? Under that circumstance, the two doormen would have been justified in defending Ms. Carey under the theory of defense of others. And the rights would be the same, just as though they were the ones being attacked. In that scenario, it was reasonable to believe, or it would have been reasonable to believe that someone was in imminent danger of suffering great bodily injury. I mean, it was clear, the attack was ongoing. It was happening right before their eyes. And it was clear that immediate use of force was necessary to defend further attack on the victim who was laying on the ground, um, bleeding uh, with, with, uh, because of her injuries. Now, there, there are, Three things that I want you to keep in mind when you are uh, analyzing self-defense. And it's, it essentially, it's, it breaks down to, are you in imminent danger of suffering great bodily injury? Or is another person in imminent danger of suffering great bodily injury? And is it reasonable that you believe that the immediate use of force was necessary? And lastly, did you use reasonable and proportional force? Now, I can't emphasize enough that this is a very basic and general overview and there are a lot of nuances and facts and differences that can change the outcome of whether or not self-defense would apply. But my general rule is always this, if you use more force than necessary, then you are not acting in justifiable self-defense. I also want you to consider other ways that you can uh, defend yourself or protect others uh, that, um, that are less lethal. 
Um, and in California, uh, actually, I'll focus on a, a few types of non-lethal non -lethal, non self-defense uh, methods, uh, but I'm not gonna talk about um, guns because that would require another presentation. So for tonight's purposes, um, I will talk about the legality and the ability to carry pepper spray for self-defense, uh, stun guns for self-defense, personal alarms or whistles as a means of deterrence, and knives. I mean, I, with regards to knives, I do want to cite the code. It's penal code section 21510, 21510. Of course, knife laws and um, weapon laws in California are very technical, so I, I want you to look at that uh, and, and determine whether or not the knife that you have in question would be uh, legal to carry under the law. Now, your rights as a person who's been attacked and your rights as a witness don't end at self-defense laws. Uh, there are countless resources for you from law enforcement agencies, the prosecutor's office, and community-based organizations. And as Chief Chow mentioned earlier, if you, if you have been attacked or if you witness an attack, the next logical step is to contact law enforcement. And it's important for you to record the details of the incident uh, while they are fresh in your memory. And even though you feel that the incident you witnessed or had to deal with didn't rise to a crime, uh, you are still strongly encouraged to report that incident so law enforcement can at the very least uh, keep statistics and data. And also if this person uh, who was uh, the suspect or the assailant had prior history with law enforcement um, and had history of uh, attacking other individuals based on um, being um, a minority or based on their gender or religion, uh, that type of prior reports can assist in the prosecution of future cases. Now, once that report is made, uh, you have the right to request for your information to be kept from the public and you have the right to access uh, certain portions of the police report as well. Uh, many police agencies, including LAPD for sure, has victims resources available on site at the police stations. Um, and oftentimes there are victim service representatives who are stationed on site at the police station to help you fill out forms and access public funds that are available to you as a victim of crime or as a witness uh, to a crime. Additionally, each county in California has a victim's resource center. And usually that's at the DA's office and each county does have a district attorney. And each center, has a victim advocate on site who helps find counseling, housing. Uh, they help you prepare for court. They help you apply for restitution, seek compensation if you suffered monetary losses, and most importantly, to assist you in getting protective orders. And I know specifically at the DA's office in LA, uh, they do have a Bureau of Victims Services who can assist you in, in uh, obtaining and procuring all the resources that you have as a victim of crime. And most importantly, as a victim of crime or as a witness to a crime, you have the right to have an attorney present with you in making a police report and throughout all stages of the case, from the time that you are interviewed up until the time that uh, it gets to court and if that assailant is convicted, you have the right to make what's known as a victim impact statement. And these are all things that uh, you can discuss with the representative either from LAPD or the sheriffs or from the district attorney's office in your county. And, and most importantly, I do wanna talk about the California Victim Compensation Board. And this is a board that is specifically funded uh, and gives out funds and to those who qualify uh, for certain crime related expenses, such as medical expenses. If you were attacked and you suffered injury and you had to go to the hospital or see a doctor, uh, they will assist in relocation, providing you first and last month's uh, rent if, if you need to move because of future, of the possibility of future harm. And also they will assist you in loss of income. And importantly, this is very important that even if the prosecutor chooses not to file charges, you are still eligible for this type of coverage from the California Victim Compensation Board. Um, since many of our audience members tonight are from LA, I do want to put in a plug for the LA City Attorney's Office, as well as the LA District Attorney's Office. Uh, their websites are very uh, fill, are filled with a lot of resources for you. And I do wanna highlight for the City of LA, 
there is actually an app that you can download on your iPhone or your, your Android phone. Um, and there are resources on that app available in 14 different languages. And for, uh, based on my experience with the LADA's office, I know for sure that the representatives there are always ready and willing to provide you with uh, any resources and answer any questions that you may have. Now, I do wanna end on this note, is, is that the reality is that if you are a victim of a crime uh, or a hate incident, a hate crime or a hate incident, you're gonna feel alone. You're gonna feel alienated. It can be very embarrassing and you're gonna feel isolated. But if anything, after tonight, I do hope that you feel a sense of empowerment because there are rights and protections of the law that most of you didn't know and hopefully now know are on your side. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. So next, we're happy to have uh, Emily Kaufman here from the Anti-Defamation League. The ADL is a leading anti-hate organization that was founded in 1913 in response to an escalating climate of anti-Semitism and bigotry. Emily is an investigative researcher with ADL, and she has a presentation about ADL's work in hate and resources. Please welcome Emily Kaufman. Hey, thank you so much for having me, and just uh, bear with me for just a second as I share my screen. Um, I have a few, few slides to share with you all this evening. All right, um, can everyone see that okay? Is that, all right, okay, great. All right, with that, I'll get started. Um, so to start, I wanted to say uh, that fighting extremism, hate, and anti-Semitism has never been more important. So we live in an era of multiple simultaneous threats from a range of extremists and movements, which are increasingly skilled at exploiting technology to recruit and radicalize followers. So the Anti-Defamation League is dedicated to shining a bright light on those groups that operate in the shadows. Uh, so in our brief time together today, I will outline some of the broad trends we are seeing in extremism and resources for fighting hate when we see it. Oh, I'm sorry that jumped ahead on me, but that's okay. <laughs> um, as we uh, consider hate in our society today, it is prudent to maintain a heightened precaution, um, but also not to give way to fear or paranoia. It is important that we, uh, it's in, it is important to be well informed and understand how the monitoring and reporting of incidents can help our community feel safer. So our staff monitors, exposes, and disrupts extremist threats and activity on the ground and online. Uh, and we share our expertise and support law enforcement. Um, we know uh, Deputy Chief Chow Well, who's on the call with us today. Um, we also support uh, the tech industry, community groups, and other constituents. Uh, so as ADL's research and investigative arm, the Center on Extremism is a clearinghouse of real-time information about extremism and hate of all types. So Center on Extremism staff regularly serve as expert witnesses, provide congressional testimony, and speak to national and international conference audiences about the threats posed by extremism and by anti-Semitism. So uh, to give a quick overview of some of the trends in extremism and hate that we've been seeing, we can look to the events uh, leading up to the insurrection on January 6th of this year. So the events of 2020 really tested our nation. We wrestled with a global pandemic and subsequent lockdowns. We had protests throughout the summer in a deeply contentious election cycle characterized by political discourse and vitriol. But we saw these flashpoints throughout the year marked by protests, arrests, and murder. We observed anger at perceived government restrictions, limiting movement in the name of public health. We saw the rise of the anti-government Boogaloo movement uh, with some incidents occurring in California related to that movement. Uh, and it, this movement has resulted in several plots and murders, including the murder of two police officers. Uh, we witnessed vigilante violence as a 17 year old was charged with murdering two men, taking law enforcement matters into his own hands. And we watched as a self-described Antifa member killed a man associated with the right wing group, Patriot Prayer. So 2020, as we all know, was a difficult year, uh, but it's important to note that, either, either, that with each of these flashpoints, momentum was built, ideology was further harnessed, and tactics were developed uh, into the landscape of extremism that we are still seeing today. 
So in addition, right, leading up to the insurrection, Capitol buildings hold this particular symbolic weight. And by the end of 2020, storming legislative buildings had become an accepted tactic for right-wing protesters. So this is another trend that we were seeing uh, leading up to the insurrection. So um, our extremist landscape and our landscape of hate doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? Uh, these are things that we can monitor and track uh, that, that leads uh, into to bigger, uh, bigger events. So the storming of those Capitol buildings uh, really set the stage for the storming of the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, to date, our Center on Extremism has inventoried the arrest of 512 people on charges related to the insurrection. And again, these numbers are pretty fluid as law enforcement continues to make arrests, um, but it's estimated about 800 insurgents entered the Capitol building. And when we break this down, it includes uh, about 119 people, so approximately 23% of people held extremist views. So of course, um, with all of this, what's concerning is not only this extremist element, um, but the fact that 77% of those in our arrest inventory are not part of an extremist group, but have been motivated to engage in extremist behavior by a climate of escalating violence, right? And we've, we've watched now the trends over the past six to eight months uh, where we've seen these groups try to retool, where we've seen the QAnon conspiracy theorists, for example, um, embrace more anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. We've seen the Proud Boys have an act of summer um, with, uh, with some participation in violent protests in Los Angeles. And so we've been tracking and carefully monitoring these extremist groups. But again, we are also concerned about how rhetoric uh, in general motivates people who are not card carrying extremists um, to action uh, potentially in their own communities. Uh, so now that we've looked at these broader trends of the past nearly two years, I want to highlight that in addition to violent incidents we've seen, white supremacist propaganda distribution has also been on the rise. So this is something that we might see more in our communities. And propaganda, propaganda gives white supremacists the ability to maximize media and online attention while limiting the risk of exposure or arrest. And the literature that they distribute helps to bolster recruitment efforts and spread fear by targeting specific groups. By, excuse me, by targeting specific groups, including the Jewish, Black, Muslim, and LGBTQ plus communities, as well as non-white immigrants. And white supremacist propaganda surged across the United States in 2020, uh, with a total of 5,125 cases of racist, anti-Semitic, and other hateful messages reported by ADL. 2020 actually marked the highest level of incidents since ADL began tracking such data with an average of about 14 incidents per day. Um, and the highest levels of activity were in Texas, Washington, and California. Uh, we have full information from this report um, on our website as well that I can link um, for all those. Um, but now I would like to move into resources that everyone can use to report and monitor hate in our own communities, as we've seen in this escalating climate of rhetoric. Um, unfortunately, hate may come to our communities. So this is a screenshot of our, of our heat map, um, which is updated um, in real time to the best of our ability, and it's a great resource to use. Uh, so you can zoom in. You see I've taken a screenshot of Los Angeles here, um, and you can actually... Um, really, really zoom into your neighborhood uh, so you can see uh, what incidents are occurring. And you can sort um, by different types of incidents, right? So um, if I pulled up this map, I can see that um, Los Angeles had 13 incidents of white supremacist propaganda between 2020 and 2021, and 73 anti-Semitic incidents, for example. So this allows you uh, to compare in real time um, before our anti-Semitic audit comes out, for example, you can see what is happening in your community, what is going on, on a daily basis. And this includes, right, not only the hate crimes, um, which we, we've heard folks discuss, um, but also these hate incidents and incidents of propaganda. Um, in addition, we have a, a tracker of just anti-Semitic incidents. Uh, so with the high holidays coming up, um, we are especially vigilant um, given that uh, uh, Jewish communities will be gathering for these holidays. Uh, so this is another resource that you can just zoom into anti-Semitic uh, incidents specifically. 
Um, in addition, we wanted to highlight our reporting mechanism. Of course, um, the first thing that you want to do if you've witnessed a hate incident, as has been emphasized here, is to report to law enforcement. Uh, we also really appreciate reporting on our side. Um, this helps us uh, create those maps and things that folks can use um, and helps us recognize patterns and things over time. Uh, we also work closely with our law enforcement partners uh, to provide any information that we can that might be helpful. Uh, you can also reach out to us um, via this reporting mechanism or by calling your local ADL office. Uh, you can also email la at adl.org and that will connect you with your local ADL office. Uh, and you can ask questions if you're not sure if something is a, a hate symbol, for example. So if you see graffiti in your community and you're, you're not quite sure what it means, um, that's something that our experts on the Center on Extremism can assess for you. Um, and we can, we can uh, send that information along as well. So this is the link to our reporting tool. I also wanted to highlight our great educational resources that are available. Uh, so on our website here, again, at, at this URL that I can pop in the chat as well, um, we have resources for educators, parents, and families, um, as well as resources to learn about um, a variety of symbols uh, and actually how, how you might be able to stand up to hate. Uh, in addition, um, ADL does do uh, in-person anti-bias uh, and anti-discrimination training in the platform in the in the classroom. Excuse me, um, that our education team um, provides. So those are all resources um, that are available to you, both online and again, um, actually having that expertise brought um, in person to teach uh, anti-bias lessons at at your uh, your community schools. Uh, lastly, um, on, on our ADL blog, uh, you can keep up uh, with current trends in extremism. We are constantly writing about things that are happening. So if you are interested in remaining well informed on uh, some broader national trends, uh, as well as trends specific to the Los Angeles area, our blog is a good place to look. Um, and, you know, when we talk about extremism and what we're all here to do today is to talk about the piece about what, what can you do. Um, so the, we've uh, outlined some steps here. Um, ADL is currently uh, trying to pass a PROTECT plan, um, which is looking at uh, domestic terrorism laws in the United States to make sure we have robust protection from domestic terrorists. Uh, so this is one way that you can help. Um, reporting, again, that, that has been so emphasized so strongly today is, is really important to us as well. So we can get that good data. Um, in addition, bringing ADL to your school or community and of course, uh, teaching our students and our children and our community members to be critical consumers of information and model the behavior we want mirrored by our children every day, right? So we can all uh, fight hate for good. Um, and happy to answer any questions uh, that come up. I know this this was a, a quick session, so uh, please feel free to reach out uh, by email with any questions that, that you might have after this presentation. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate uh, you taking the time to listen today. Thank you, Emily. Uh, finally, we have one more presenter this evening, uh, Commissioner Abigail Zielinski, who is an attorney and president of the Philippine American Bar Association, and also a commissioner on the city's Commission on Civil Rights. And um, Abigail will cover employment rights and discrimination. Abigail. I'm gonna mute myself. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Commissioner Wershofter. I'm going to give a brief overview of your rights if you experience hate incidents in the form of discrimination and harassment at the workplace, or if you witness hate incidents at the workplace. Before I do, I want to give a little background about my commission, the Civil and Human Rights Commission. It was established in 2019 as a result of work from advocacy groups like the Black Worker Center. A year later, the LA Civil Rights Department was formed at the end of 2020. The purpose of LA Civil Rights is combating inequities and discrimination. While the newly formed LA Civil Rights is not yet able to take cases, when it does, it will be able to take complaints on discrimination in housing, commerce, education, and employment by private actors that's happened within the city of LA. My discussion today will address workplace discrimination. California law and federal law prohibit workplace discrimination and harassment on a wide range of protected categories. Because California law is typically more protective than federal law, I'm going to focus on California. In California, it's illegal to discriminate or harass an employee based on actual or perceived or association with race, 
color, ancestry, national origin, language, citizenship, religion, religious creed, which includes religious dress and grooming practices, sex, including pregnancy, childbirth, breastfeeding or related medical conditions, gender, gender identity, gender expression, age over 40 years old, sexual orientation, veteran or military status, physical or mental disability, medical condition, genetic information, and marital status. Discrimination is when you're treated differently or unfavorably based on one of these protected classes. Discrimination will have some concrete adverse employment action that's motivated by your protected status, perceived status or association with that status. Uh, this can include termination, demotion, suspension, being put on a performance improvement plan when others uh, haven't been for the same infraction, a poor performance review, not getting selected for a job, failure to promote, um, things of that nature. If this has happened to you and it was motivated by your membership and protected, uh, protected status, then that might be a violation of the law and you should report it. Um, I'll talk about reporting in a little bit. Uh, unlawful harassment as opposed to discrimination um, can include like uh, uh, verbal harassment, such as slurs, jokes, insults, gestures, teasing, um, visual harassment, uh, which can include the posting or dis distribution of offensive uh, posters, symbols, drawings, computer displays, or in emails, um, physical conduct, uh, such as physically threatening another person, blocking someone's way, uh, or making physical contact in an unwelcome manner. Your boss, manager, supervisor, uh, owner of the company, coworkers are not allowed to discriminate or harass you. Your employer can also be liable if the discrimination harassment um, is from customers, clients, vendors, or other third parties. So if your employer knows or should know that you're being harassed, they need to prevent it from happening. There are two important agencies on the state and federal level that, have, that address this type of harassment and discrimination when it happens at the workplace. In California, we have the Department of Fair Employment Housing, the DFEH, um, and federally we have the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or the EEOC. You can file a complaint with either the EEOC or the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, the DFEH. Um, and we'll put a link uh, to LA Civil Rights uh, and there are links to these uh, two agencies. Um, you can file with either one. The two agencies have overlapping jurisdictions, um, meaning they can take the same complaint, um, but that's not always the case. If you're uncertain, generally speaking, California law is more protective than federal law, so it might be a good idea to try the DFEH first. Um, it's their job. It's both agencies' job to protect people from unlawful discrimination and harassment. They'll investigate on your behalf, and depending on the findings, they may file a complaint and prosecute. They may also try to mediate, which means they'll see if there's a resolution they can help with, um, that doesn't involve prosecution or filing a lawsuit. If the DFEH or the EEOC do not prosecute, then you have the ability to file a civil lawsuit on your, on, on your own behalf or with a private attorney. You should always be mindful of timeframes. And with anything concerning your legal rights, the sooner the better. In these types of situations, you don't need to hire a private attorney to represent you, though you may. If it happens in the workplace, it's very important to make a record. Whether or not you file a claim, you should report it to your manager or supervisor. And if you have one, the human resources department. And if you're a bystander, you have rights too. Even if the harassment is not directed at you, but you have been subjected to it within your working environment, you have the ability to make a complaint to human resources, your supervisor, manager, 
or with the DEH or the EOC. Likewise, even if you don't have membership in a protected class, um, to, uh, and you have association with that protected class, you can file a complaint. So the bottom line is, if you've been subject to racist, anti-Semitic, uh, or other discriminatory actions, or witness of uh, such actions, you have rights, and you have uh, you should report. Um, you don't need to tolerate it. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back to Commissioner Wishaker. Thank you so much, Commissioner Zelensky. So now we have a little time to open it up to some questions. Uh, I saw that there was one question that came up uh, much earlier in the chat, and I'd love to start by going back to that. Um, so I think Christine asked earlier, does reasonable force account for difference in abilities of the attacker, of the attack versus the attacker? So say a smaller person needing a weapon to be effective against a larger attacker, for example. So um, uh, Adrian, I think that question came up during your presentation. Do you want to address that? Sure, absolutely. So in that scenario, the reasonable force uh, would allow the victim to use uh, some type of weapon if there is such a disparity between the attacker and the, uh, the person who's being attacked. Uh, but I do want to focus on uh, the proportionality of the self-defense that, that, that the person is using on the attacker. So although a weapon would be allowed, um, it still has to be proportional, right? So if the attacker is 500 pounds and the person being attacked is 100 pounds and the person chooses to use a baseball bat or to, to get a piece of a, a metal bar to defend him or herself, that still has to be proportional to the uh, amount of force that you are, that is being used against you during the attack. Thank you. So if others have questions, if you could please use the chat box or the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask, we will try to get to those. And Mark, if you see people, let, please let me know. Okay, well, let me give that another 30 seconds here. All right, hearing none, um, I'm gonna move us towards closing. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you to our speakers, to the city of Los Angeles and all the co-sponsors for making this training series possible. The next Know Your Rights and Bystander Intervention Training will be on September 28th at 5.30 p.m. You can sign up at bit.ly slash stop hate training. For more information on stopping hate or to find resources mentioned today, please visit civilandhumanrights.lacity.org slash LA for all. Uh, you can learn more about the city of uh, Los Angeles City Human Relations Commission at civilandhumanrights.lacity.org as well. I'm Brooke Wurchafter, Commissioner on the Los Angeles Human Relations Commission and today's moderator. Thank you all for joining us and have a great evening. Good night. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.